Some of the most fascinating characters of the Christmas story are the mysterious wise men who followed a star from the east, the Magi. Not the Maggie, the noodles from the east, but the Magi. Who were they and why did they show up? Let me read to you from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least amongst the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they'd heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they'd seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Some say the Magi were astrologers from Babylon, modern day Iraq, in which case they traveled 500 miles to visit the baby Jesus. Others say they were Zoroastrians from the court of Persia, modern day Iran, in which case they traveled a thousand miles. But a second century document found in the Vatican archives tells of a caravan of wise men who followed a star along the Silk Route from the land of Shur, the ancient name associated with China. So if the Magi had come from China, then they traveled over 5,000 miles, more than a year of pilgrimage to see this child. And in contrast, we read that King Herod couldn't even be bothered to travel just the six miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to go and see who this baby was. And the Magi had followed a star, an unusual astronomical phenomenon that had appeared in the sky, which they took as a sign that the king of kings who would unite and rule the earth had been born. Perhaps the star was Venus, known as the morning star, that led them to the one known as the bright morning star. Pagan history actually also records a star that was given the Egyptian name Masori, meaning birth of a prince, which rose and shone in the sky around 2 BC, just as Jesus was born. And the wise men, believing that a king had been born, they assumed that he must be found in a palace in Jerusalem. So they turn up there in the wrong place and ask the jealous King Herod, oh, where is this child king who's been born? And in so doing, they nearly end up getting the baby Jesus killed. So perhaps they're not quite so wise after all. How often do we look for God? How often do we look for truth and hope in the wrong place? A friend of mine says that if they'd been wise women, they would have asked for directions, turned up on time, in the right place, and brought with them more practical presence. But when the wise men finally make it to Bethlehem, following the star again, they are overjoyed and they bow before the baby Jesus in worship and present him with, well, let's say, unusual gifts. You know, we tend to give gifts that we think the recipient will enjoy or want to receive. 
I read of a Christmas letter that someone wrote to Santa Claus. It said, Dear Santa, this year for Christmas, I'd like a great big fat bank account and a slim body. Please don't mix these two up like you did last year. But the gifts that the Magi present to the Christ child are different. They are prophetic gifts and speak not of what the child wanted, but of who he is. What do these prophetic gifts tell us about this special child born that first Christmas? Well, the first gift is gold. This gift tells us that Jesus is the king who reigns. Gold fit for a king. Although Mary was just a young teenage unmarried mum and Joseph a mere carpenter from Nazareth, the impressive wise men bow before the child who'd been born in a stable and placed in a manger and they give him gold. They acknowledge him as king. And around that time, a prophecy had spread throughout the known world that a king would be born who would unite all peoples and rule over a kingdom of peace. Jesus is that king, the king of kings, who is in control and reigns above it all. You know, if your life feels a bit out of control or unstable, or perhaps you're under extraordinary pressure beyond that which you can bear, then you can turn to him, the king of kings. Whatever the situation, Jesus is the king who brings a reassurance, a peace amidst the uncertainty. That's why Jesus is known as the prince of peace. During the horrors of World War I on the Western Front in Ypres, at midnight on Christmas Eve, the German soldiers in their trench began to sing out aloud a Christian carol, Stille Nacht, Silent Night. Just a few hundred meters away in their trench, the British soldiers heard the Germans singing Christmas carols and they responded by also singing a carol, the first Noel. Now, it's unclear who moved first, but as the two sides began to sing these worship carols, they one by one started to get out of the trench and they began to walk towards each other in no man's land, finally meeting in the middle and embracing in friendship. They started to wish each other, Happy Christmas, Fröhlicher Weihnachten, and then what happened is what often happens when the Brits and the Germans get together. They had a football match. Now, unfortunately, yep, you guessed it. As usual, the German team won three goals to one. But I'm reassured that the referee was German. Now, amidst all of the horror and terror of World War I, that night, peace broke out along two thirds of the Western Front. Only Jesus, the Prince of Peace can do that. You see, when you let Jesus into your heart, you let in peace. Knowing that he is the CEO of the universe, the King no less, the one who rules and reigns above it all. You can't know what the future holds, but you can know the one who holds the future, the king who reigns. The second gift the wise men present to the child is frankincense. And this gift tells us that Jesus is the high priest who prays. Christmas nativity plays are, are not what they perhaps once were. A friend of mine back in England told me how his son was in a nativity play. So um, the, the, the son's school was putting on. So he and his wife went along to see it. They were excited. But he said that what unfolded in the play was, well, chaos. It started off by one of the young boys who was playing one of the shepherds. 
he ran over to the manger on stage, looked in it and said in a very loud voice, where's the egg? One of the other children said, what do you mean, where's the egg? And the little shepherd said, well, they said Mary laid him in a manger. Just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, on came the wise men. The first wise man, he delivered his line, the easiest line, I bring gold. The second wise man was meant to say, I bring frankincense, but instead said, I bring Frankenstein. Mary looked a bit worried. The third wise man, hearing the second one say, I bring Frankenstein, obviously thought, oh, we're going off script. We're ad-libbing. And he said, well, in that case, I bring Pokemon. The whole room started laughing. But frankincense was a type of incense burnt in the temple as a sign of prayers going up to heaven. As it says in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold, hold firmly to the faith we profess. And verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What this is saying is that through Jesus, you can approach the throne of grace. You can approach God for help. You see, when we pray to Jesus, he intercedes, he prays on our behalf to God the Father, and we can have full access to God the Father through Jesus the Son. We don't have to bargain in our prayers. It's a bit like the little boy who saw um, a miniature nativity scene uh, as decorations uh, in his home. He took the figure of Mary out of the nativity scene and put Mary in his pocket. He ran up to his bedroom and he prayed to Jesus. He said, Jesus, I've got your mum. And unless you give me a bicycle for Christmas, you'll never see her again. We don't have to bargain anymore. We can have confidence when we pray in the name of Jesus. I mean, what would you like to ask God for this Christmas? There's another little boy who wanted a watch for Christmas so desperately that he kept on nagging his parents, asking them again and again for a watch. Eventually, the parents had had enough. They said to him, look, if you ask for a watch one more time, you're not going to get any presents at all this Christmas. The boy was quiet the rest of the day, but at evening time, the boy asked his parents if he could pray and say grace before dinner. They were very pleased and said, sure. So the boy stood up and said, I'd like to begin our prayer with reading from scripture. Mark chapter 13, verse 37. Jesus said, I told you once, I tell you again, watch. Now it might not be a watch that you want this Christmas, but really, what do you want to ask God for? You can ask him right now in the name of Jesus. He is the high priest who prays. And then the third gift that the Magi present to the child is myrrh. This tells us that Jesus is the savior who saves. Now this was the most unusual of the gifts. Myrrh was an embalming oil that was put on dead bodies to preserve them at burial. Not a great gift for a baby shower. But this child would grow up, die on a cross, and rise to new life. A child wrote this letter to Santa at Christmas. Dear Santa, there are three little boys in our house. Jeffrey is two, David is four, and Norman is seven. Jeffrey is good none of the time. David is good some of the time. Norman is good all of the time. I am Norman. But of course, none of us is good all of the time. If our greatest need had been for money, God would have sent a banker. If it had been for pleasure, he would have sent an entertainer. But as our greatest need is for forgiveness, he sent a saviour. 
Today, you can be forgiven and know the ability, the power to forgive others, and you can be therefore set free by Jesus. Alpha is uh, an opportunity to explore the meaning of life and faith and chat and make friends with others as you journey together throughout the course. And on the middle of Alpha, there's a weekend away. And we, we were running Alpha and on the weekend away, there was a guest who'd come, a guy called Keith. He was not a Christian. He'd loved the weekend away. And as he was driving back home in his car, for the first time, he prayed. He said, God, I think I believe Jesus is your son, but I still have a question. Why do I need him? Amen. So he asked that question, why do I need him in his prayer? And then when he finished, he turned on the car radio and he said the song seemed to answer his prayer. In fact, he was so surprised, he got out his phone and he shazammed it. And the song was apparently, Frankie Knuckles presents Marshall Jefferson, Move Your Body. Now that song has only one lyric and the words are, it's gonna set you free. It's gonna set you free. It's gonna set you free. Actually, it repeats that line 18 times. Eventually, Keith thought, okay, I get the point. Jesus is gonna set me free. So he prayed, okay, Jesus, I'm ready. Would you come into my life? By the time Keith pulled into the McDonald's, Pandulalu, he was already filled with the Holy Spirit. And when he drove to the window to pick up his burger, he was grinning with joy from ear to ear. The woman said, wow, you're pleased to have your burger. To which Keith said, no, I've just received something far better than that. You see, the passage in Matthew 2 says the wise men opened their treasures and presented Jesus with their gifts. The gifts tell us about the one who is the true gift of Christmas. So will you open up the treasure trove of your heart and receive him, the greatest great gift, the savior who saves? Will you receive him right now? If so, I'm just gonna pray a short prayer to you that can be found in this pamphlet, Why Christmas? And if you'd like to receive the Christ child again, once more in your heart, then just echo this prayer. This is for you. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong in my life. And if anything comes to mind, just ask forgiveness for it right now. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything which I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.